a little message from, a very short one, from uh, Sensei. Uh, I'd sent him, as usual, uh, a fax to say we were beginning our summer courses and telling him a little bit, a bit about the aim of each course and so on. And he just sent a message back saying, thank you very much indeed for your report. I'm praying for the great success of all your summer courses. Okay, so Sensei's thoughts are with us. Um, now, this today is uh, a chance for us to study what is an extraordinarily important document, though it was written uh, long ago, in 1951. And uh, in going through it very carefully, I felt that if everybody, uh, including me, understands part one, then you can understand part two without any difficulty. So I intend to concentrate today on studying together with you part one. And then I'd be most grateful if you then read on your own again, even a couple of times over, part two, I believe the whole thing will then crystal clear. Uh, I will, if there's time, just dip into two main important points in part two, but we shall not go through it all in detail. Is that okay? So uh, I leave it to you to tackle part two. So uh, I, since this was written in 1951, it's necessary really for us to pull our minds back to the way things were at that time. This was written on the 10th of July 1951, uh, that was just two months after President Toda was inaugurated as the second president of Soka Gakkai. And of course, it was just a few years only after the end of World War II in 1945. So uh, lots of you here today uh, weren't uh, as conversant with those times as I am. Uh, but even so, we need to have some feeling about the circumstances then. So, uh, just two months, as I say, after President Toda was inaugurated, he wrote this thesis. And there is no doubt that his purpose in writing it uh, was to explain the whole situation as he saw it from the time the Gakkai was founded in 1930 up to and during World War II uh, to the year of 1951. And then to express the principles, really, on which he intended to continue uh, developing the Soka Gakkai and the movement for Kosen Rufu uh, until he had to give up the presidency. As you may know, uh, he continued right up to the point of his death, really, uh, which was in 1958, much sooner than most people expected. But, of course, he'd suffered tremendously in prison during World War II, and he came out of prison a physical wreck. So it was simply amazing what he achieved in those few short years from 1945 to 1958. So uh, especially he wished to point out in this thesis the struggles of Mr. Makiguchi, his predecessor as first president, particularly during the time of World War II and uh, the serious problems which Mr. Makiguchi encountered with the priesthood. And uh, Mr. Toda also wanted, in his straightforward, very direct way, to make sure everybody understood that he'd made a couple of big mistakes himself in his efforts to uh, uh, give the Sogakai a sort of rebirth, because it had dwindled to nothing by the end of World War II. And he wanted, too, to talk about his enlightenment to his own mission, which, of course, in turn was uh, directly related to the mission of the Soka Gakkai. And above all, he wished to make it clear, uh, though he was polite about it in many ways, that the priesthood really must purify themselves. So this problem uh, has been going on a long time. So in a nutshell, I think we could say that this thesis uh, concerns our inheritance today 
of the true law, of the heritage of that uh, ultimate and true law. Really, that's the importance of this document. Uh, as in all things, Buddhism teaches us, uh, if we understand the past, then uh, we can understand the reasons for the present. And in addition, of course, we can shape our determinations for the future. So we have to look back for a little while before we begin to study the thesis at what it was like 40 years ago or so. So in many ways, things were very different. But I think in terms of uh, the more profound view of those times, it was extraordinarily similar to what we find today. And in this connection, I would recommend that if you haven't done so already, you read uh, the plea which has been published as an inset into the last bulletin that came out uh, last week, I think it was. Uh, because this plea uh, is in a way an extension of everything that Mr. Toda is saying here. The plea was made by four great pioneer leaders of Kosen Rufu. Uh, Vice President Izumi, who some of you here may know, uh, Miss Kashiwabara, who also a few of you know, Mr. Tsuji, whom even if you haven't met him or seen him, you may have read his guidance, which is fam famous for his guidance on sickness, and a Mr. Shiraki, who I don't know, but these four leaders have all practiced for over 50 years. And they have written this plea to the high priest uh, in uh, very moving terms and very directly and frankly, uh, but utterly sincerely. So if you haven't read that in the bulletin, when you go home, please do. So uh, uh, six years after World War II, the destruction in Japan had been so colossal during the war that the situation hadn't greatly changed by then. That is to say, Japan was in ruins. It's not always realized that uh, because we, we know so much about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it's not often realized that every other city in Japan had been destroyed by aerial bombing and the use of fire bombs and so on. The only city which was left at all intact was Kyoto, which was spared by the Allies because of its cultural importance. But everywhere else was in ruins. And on top of that, of course, the economy had totally collapsed. This was because Japan had been waging war for many years. One has to remember that uh, Long before World War II broke out, they had been uh, at war in China, uh, and their aggressive policies had been continued for a number of years, leading right into World War II. So with the collapse of the country, uh, one can imagine that inflation was a huge problem. Uh, trading was mostly in the black market, and virtually everyone was poverty-stricken, certainly amongst ordinary people, completely poverty-stricken. Their businesses or their way of work or whatever it was had collapsed and there was just no money and no way uh, to earn it easily. So it was really an appalling situation and it's credible when we look at Japan now, uh, it's hard to realize that the, that state of chaos and ruin existed. One day, if you haven't already had the chance to do so, you may be able to listen to the experiences of Japanese members who practiced uh, in those times. Early pioneers who joined after Mr. Toda had come out of prison. And they're just amazing experiences. The appalling problems that they faced and the way they, with steadfast practice and faith, they proved the power of the Gohonzon in the most wonderful ways. So far as Nichiren Shoshu and the Soka Gakkai were concerned, and please understand, when I say Nichiren Shoshu, I'm referring to the priesthood, 
because that is the title of uh, the, this particular sect uh, of priests, of Buddhist priests, Nichiren Shoshu. Though it has been used uh, loosely uh, by uh, us and other countries uh, in the past, and indeed we still do at this moment in Ennis UK and in some other countries as well. So, uh, as you know, First President Makiguchi had died in prison after uh, intense interrogation and attempts to brainwash him uh, and make him give up his faith. And this he had refused to do. Uh, he had refused to accept anything to do with Shinto in, uh, to, be in, to be added to Nichiren Daishonin's teachings including the establishment of a shrine, a uh, Shinto shrine, in his home. At that time, the priests, under pressure, had actually given in. And believe it or not, there was a Shinto shrine established at Taisekiji. And when Mr. Toda heard that they were giving in to the government's edicts, of course, he remonstrated strongly with them. And uh, uh, as a result of this, and as a result of his disobedience to the government's edicts, uh, he was imprisoned with, that, with 21 other lay leaders, including, of course, Mr. Toda. So it was a very, very grim and dark and terrible time. Uh, whilst in prison, no priest ever stood up to defend him. And indeed, the lay leaders who were in prison one by one, under interrogation, brainwashing, and sometimes beatings, uh, uh, gave up their faith, sad to say. Finally, Mr. Makiguchi, who was 74 years old, died in prison. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Toda was the only one left there. He didn't know Mr. Makiguchi had died. They never told him. He was in solitary confinement in a tiny little cell and uh, he just kept himself going uh, through chanting Daimoku daily. So this was uh, the state of affairs. The Gakkai had virtually disappeared. Of course there were some people, no doubt, who were practicing underground, secretly, uh, but the only persons who really stood up finally uh, were Toda and Makiguchi. And as a result of their stand, of course, we're here today. There can be no doubt whatsoever uh, that uh, it is because of their incredible courage and their faith uh, and indeed uh, their amazing spirit because at no time we know in prison were they ever cast down by what was, hap what was happening to them. So clear they were about uh, their mission. So we, we are able to assemble here today because those two great men went through what they went through and because Mr. Toda came out alive, though appallingly sick, and determined that before he died he would build a lay movement movement for Kosen Rufu, which could never again be so easily near destruction. So after Mr. Toda came out of prison and began to gradually collect uh, some of the old members and new members around him and spread the, the teachings, because he was able to do so uh, without worry, uh, as the new constitution of Japan established uh, at the end of the war, uh, gave the right of people to worship as they pleased for the first time uh, in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years there was freedom of religion. So after some time, uh, his burning passion and understanding of his mission, Kosen Rufu, of course, grew strongly and developed. And he spread it to others. And uh, the first of two very important things then occurred. One was that he went to the high priest of those times, whose name was Nisho, and he asked him to grant the establishment 
of uh, a Jojo Gohansen in the Sukhagakai's headquarters. Jojo Gohansen is like we have in the New Century Hall, that is to say, it is a Gohansen specifically inscribed by the high priest and dedicated uh, for something or someone. And that dedication is actually shown uh, in Japanese characters on the Gohansen. So he asked for this Gohansen, which would be the focal point of the movement for Kosen Rufu, which he was absolutely determined to uh, develop. And this was granted, and the first time ever, therefore, a large Gohansen, Jojo Gohansen, was established in a lay people's center. Never had such a thing happened before. The only place where such Gohansens, Jojo Gohansens existed, were in temples. And the second thing he did, with the help of the retired high priest uh, at that time, was to collect together the Gosho and publish them in one volume uh, for the Japanese members. It's hard to believe that prior to that, the Gosho, generally speaking, was not available to the members, except when quoted, passages were quoted by priests who were giving lectures. Otherwise, uh, the Gosho was unavailable. And uh, through this great effort, he was able to celebrate his inauguration to the presidency in 1951 by the publication of the Gosho for the first time for ordinary lay people. The third point, sorry, there were three. The third point, which uh, he also discussed with the high priest, was his conviction that if the lay people were to have the power and the life force and the wisdom to conduct an effective uh, movement for Kosen Rufu, then it was essential that they practiced in a proper and full manner, just as the priests had practiced. So it may also surprise you to know that previously the lay people had not practiced as the priests practiced. That is to say, they had not done Gongyo. Uh, of course, they chanted Daimoku uh, a bit here and there, and maybe some of them who were diligent perhaps recited a passage from the Lotus Sutra, but otherwise the lay people did not do Gongyo. And he felt that to establish power and unity for the movement for Kosen Rufu, for all the members to uh, do Gongyo was essential. And uh, this request uh, also was agreed by the high priest, who, uh, one must emphasize, totally understood the extraordinary phenomenon of the appearance of the Sokogakai. So uh, it's, again, difficult for us to realize, because we're so used to the Sokogakai, uh, that uh, no such lay movement had appeared ever in the history of Buddhism in Japan. Uh, the only system for lay people was to gather uh, at, their at their local temple round their priest and to support the temple in very much the way the provisional uh, uh, sects pre-Lotus Sutra had always done. And indeed, in the same way as is done today in Southeast Asia, uh, where Hinayana Buddhism is practiced. That is to say, the lay people made their good causes by supporting the priests. And the priests did all the ceremonies and the prayers and so on. So a much similar situation existed, even in Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism, or rather in Nichiren Shoshu Buddhism. So... Uh, uh, this appearance of a lay movement was something quite new, a lay movement which wasn't actually under uh, the direction of priests, but was under the direction of a lay leader who in turn was under the direction of the high priest. So uh, the significance of this was tremendous. 
And Mr. Toda discussed with the, high, with the high priest of those times what was the best way to establish uh, this lay organization that appeared after World War II uh, so far as the laws of Japan were concerned, how to establish it legally. And the high priest totally agreed with Mr. Toda that it should be a separate legal entity from the head temple, as it is to this day. So, uh, the reasons for this were that, firstly, if at any time the priesthood were persecuted or attacked, the Gakkai would be able to protect them best by being a separate legal entity. They wouldn't, in other words, we, they would be able to stand strongly and draw the persecution off the priests onto themselves. The second reason was that the high priest also was well aware of the problems which existed in the priesthood. And it wasn't to his full satisfaction by any means. Therefore, he clearly saw the mission of the Gachai and related it indeed to the Lotus Sutra, uh, which had been taught by Shakyamuni, as you know, 3,000 years or so before, where he describes in the ceremony uh, of the treasure tower and the ceremony of the air the rising up of thousands and tens of thousands of bodhisattvas of the earth uh, who appeared, as it were, from nowhere in order to spread the teachings in the latter day of the law. That is to say, this age that we live in now. So, uh, with that understanding, the high priest Nisho, and indeed two subsequent high priests, totally understood the incredible importance of this phenomenon, the appearance of a lay movement of great unity and strength, but above all, a movement with absolute determination to fulfill the will and testament of Nichiren Daishonu, which was to achieve Kosen Rufu, and in the words of the Lotus Sutra, never allow its flow to cease. Up to that time, there had been no such movement. Of course, uh, there had been a little shakabuku here and there, but the priesthood themselves were not ever, had not ever led a great movement for shakabuku except in one or two small instances in various parts of Japan. So, uh, the priest, the high priest, directly related the appearance of the Gakkai to the Lotus Sutra, and in particular uh, to Nichiren Daishonin's times when, as you know, he prayed for the defeat of the Mongol uh, attack on Japan by the Mongolians. And uh, despite doing that, and despite the fact that his prayers were successful, and the Mongol invasion was defeated by a great uh, wind or typhoon, uh, even so, for the subsequent 700 years, without hardly a break, uh, Nichiren Daishonin's teachings and uh, followers were vilified, attacked, and persecuted. So in other words, uh, the high priest, and indeed, of course, we've heard this more commonly since the time of Mr. Toda, uh, the ultimate outcome of this terrible slander was the one disaster which had not yet totally occurred in the three calamities and seven disasters, which was the actual invasion of Japan itself. And this happened in World War II with incredible destruction, of course, to the Japanese people. So according to the high priest and to Mr. Toda and all those at that time, they were very clear this was the ultimate outcome of the slander that had been continuing in Japan over hundreds of years. So, uh, the three high priests, it's worth making a note of their names. The 64th high priest, Nisho Shonin, 
who, li- who was high priest from 1947 to 1956. The 65th high priest, Nichijun, shown in, who was high priest from 1956 to 1959 and had also had uh, important and great uh, significant relations with the Soka Gakkai prior to his becoming high priest. And then the 66th high priest, Nitatsu Shonen, who was high priest from 1959 to 1979. So there are certainly quite a number of you here who have Gohonzons inscribed by Nitatsu Shonen. So, uh, the final purpose of establishing Soka Gakkai as a separate legal entity, in a way it embraces the first two points I mentioned, uh, is that they would keep alive, no matter what, even if uh, things went wrong in the head temple or anywhere else, that uh, they would keep alive the true spirit of Nichiren Daishonin. And that was always at the base of all the guidance and direction which those two great first and second presidents made. And indeed, uh, it is at the basis of everything which Sensei says today. So this thesis, then, uh, is like a sort of foundation stone for the Gakkai, Uh, the foundation stone of the movement for Kosen Rufu and the organization that was established in order to bring about this movement and make it advance and grow. You'll find when you read this through that President Toda talks much more about Kosen Rufu of the Orient than he does about Kosen Rufu of the world. I think he only mentions Kosen Rufu of the world once in it. The rest of the time he's talking about Kosen Rufu of the Orient. So again we have to put our minds back to 1951 uh, when uh, Travel was still, compared to today, primitive, really. Air travel and telecommunications, again, were still in a very primitive state. Nothing like we have today. And therefore, the oriental mind, the mind of people living in China and Japan, was concerned with Asia. Today, more and more, the oriental people are concerned with the world just the same as we are. But in those days of slow communication, still the Orient was the main focus of attention. And secondly, uh, the second reason for Mr. Toda's concern about Kosen Rufu of the Orient was his uh, determination to, to repay something, give something back to the people of Asia who had suffered so terribly uh, under the Japanese military and aggressive policies over the previous many years. So his concern was, in other words, to be able to change Japan's bad karma that had been created through these aggressive actions. And it caused immense suffering uh, in Asia, both in Southeast Asia and also in China. So there you are. That's a sort of background. Are you in 1951 now? (laughs) Well, actually, you shouldn't be in 1951. You should be right here now uh, uh, in 1991. But uh, uh, nevertheless, it's important to understand that background. Okay. So then I'll ask Ilinka to begin to read part one, if you've all got your books in front of you. Right, Alinka, off we go. Part 1, July 10th, 1951, when the first president, Sunasaburo Makaguchi, stood up to lead the Soka Gakkai and propagate the true law, Nichiren and Shoshu believers had forgotten that one is punished when one opposes this great law. That's why he chose to expound the theory of punishment, both inside and outside of Nichiren and Shoshu thereby meeting every persecution in his attempt to propagate the great law. There were even priests who attacked him by saying that emphasizing the theory of punishment contradicts the doctrines of Nichiren Shoshu. 
However, President Makaguchi was resolute in expounding the dreadfulness of the punishment that one may receive by slandering the law. Until the last moment of his life, he remained resolute in proclaiming the real punishment of the law. Mr. Makaguchi, my mentor, would often say, the Gohonzon has great power. The fact that the Gohonzon has great power also means that if you slander it, you will be punished. If a father is not upstanding enough to scold his children, how can he help them to become happy? Pray to the Gohonzon sincerely. Can't you hear the Gohonzon say to you that if you slander this law, you will have your head broken into seven pieces? This statement, which we can read on the Gohonzon, actually refers to the punishment one will receive by slandering it. I agree with Mr. Makaguchi's central contention. If you deny his view, you do not actually believe in the awesome power of the Dai Gohonzon. Those people who oppose the theory of punishment are no different from those who are seduced by the superficial compassion of Shakyamuni's Buddhism. I say that they do not embody the true spirit of Nichiren Shoshu. I repeat this. In the upper right corner of the Gohonzon are the words, If you slander this law, you will have your head broken into seven pieces. Doesn't this signify the theory of punishment? At the same time, in the upper left corner of the Gohonzon is an inscription that reads, If you make offerings to the law, you will receive more good fortune than that derived from holding the ten titles of the Buddha. Doesn't this signify the promise the Gohonzon makes to us that we will receive benefits when we worship the Gohonzon? Benefit or value and punishment or anti-value constitute the reality of our daily lives. Some Nichiren Shoshu priests had forgotten that the power of the Gohonzon can be revealed in one's daily life in either way until President Makaguchi discussed it. They were astonished at what he brought out, and I am dumbfounded that many of them have since pretended that they have known this principle very well for quite some time. Also, some priests are not yet aware of this principle. I am saddened rather than surprised by their ignorance. In the Gosho, on persecutions befalling the Buddha, Nichiren Daishonin states, In the latter day of the law, both Shakyamuni and the Buddhas before him, the rulers and people who despised the votaries of the Lotus Sutra seemed to be free from punishment at first, but eventually they were all doomed to fall. This passage clearly indicates that the person who slanders the great law will receive severe punishment. Who can deny this? That would be a slanderous act, and those who do so are evil and foolish. The Daishonin also says in the same Gosho, the deaths of Ota Chikamasa, Nagasaki Tokitsuna, and Daishinbo, for example, who were all thrown from their horses, can be attributed to their treachery against the Lotus Sutra. There are four kinds of punishment, general and individual, conspicuous and inconspicuous. The massive epidemics, nationwide famines, insurrections and foreign invasions suffered by Japan are general punishment. Epidemics are also inconspicuous punishment. The tragic deaths of Ota and the others are both conspicuous and individual. Each of you should summon up the courage of a lion and never succumb to threats from anyone. President Makiguchi made the heart of this passage his own. Even though he was alarmed, he was neither scared nor astonished. Rather, he continued to expound on the punishment one will receive by slandering the law. He persisted in his theory of punishment. Thus, he was criticized by those both inside and outside Nichiren Shoshu. Thank you. So we pause there and just consider this. Because having your head broken into seven pieces sounds terrible, doesn't it? But I'll try to explain that it's very logical. And uh, though it may be very unpleasant, uh, it doesn't literally mean that your head suddenly blows up <laughs> into seven pieces. So, what this theory of benefit and punishment, this principle in Buddhism is saying, is that there are no grey areas. Either something is of value or it's anti-value. Either something, in more ordinary words, is negative or positive, positive or negative. 
You can't sit on the fence so far as Buddhism and its teachings are concerned because the law of life doesn't permit you to sit on the fence. What you are thinking, saying and doing is either negative or positive, valuable or anti-valuable, isn't it? You can't sit on the fence and get away with it, one or the other. If your life is full of positive force and power, <coughs> and for some reason you let your practice slide, it begins to become more and more filled with negative power. Not with some sort of neutral zone where you can relax <laughs> comfortably and hide away from the reality of life. Always one or the other. It's common sense, isn't it? So, if you think of this on a small scale, you can completely understand what this principle of the head being broken into seven pieces means, or rather, what this theory and principle of punishment and benefit. For example, uh, say you're, you're walking through, uh, going out of a room, and your mind is filled at that time with your... Uh, dislike of someone else and you go out and you close the door and you shut your finger in it hmm? <laughs> and if you have if you're wise and your perception is sharp which it can be because you chant Damoku you'll think to yourself I've done it again <laughs> idiot but in a way you're also very grateful for being taught that so that you can stop it by shutting your finger in the door. It's benefit. <laughs> you have that much good fortune to shut your finger in the door. Or you may get out of the car uh, and you see uh, as you're looking at a shop someone you don't like at all over there. And you ah, oh, I can't stand that woman. I hope I don't have to go into the shop with her. And you bump your head, you know, on the door of the car as you get out. So I'm sure, I mean, I can hear from the way you're responding, <laughs> that this, these sort of happenings are, are, are frequent, aren't they? And, and really, we should be grateful for them. They, they are, of course, like everything else in Buddhism, one can turn it into benefit. So, I mean, hands up, who can relate to that sort of thing? <laughs> Everybody. Including me. <laughs> so, so uh, of course, that is comparatively minor slander. Uh, but when it comes to major slander, uh, detesting uh, or hating, on chitsu, as we call it, say, a person who is actually a votary of the Lotus Sutra like oneself, is actually practicing every day, uh, then it becomes a bit more serious. And if that habit of hate or onshitsu or destructive criticism continues and you go on doing it because for some reason you're blind to it, you can't perceive it. Nishin Daishonin said our eyebrows are the nearest thing to us, but we can't see them. Often it takes another person to quite strongly point out to us that we shouldn't have those slanderous feelings which are going on inside us. And then, of course, uh, this question of one's head being broken into seven pieces begins to take effect. That is to say, because your mind is obsessed with dislike or hatred for somebody, you are distorting the balance of your mind. Instead of uh, thinking clearly in a balanced way, your balance is going over in some other direction. And inevitably, therefore, because your, the balance of your mind is out of gear, I don't mean to say you're crazy. What I mean is the mind is sort of distorted. Logic and reason doesn't work anymore in a proper and clear manner. 
Therefore, of course, you bring immense trouble on yourself. So in terms of the Gohonzon, what is the Gohonzon? The Gohonzon is a reflection of the Gohonzon that exists, or the Buddhahood that exists within our lives. That scroll has no way it can wave some sort of magic wand and condemn you to having your head broken into seven pieces. Can't, it can't hurl fire and brimstone at you hmm? <laughs> or any of those sort of things. You are punishing yourself. The Gonzan that Nichiren Daishonin described is like a mirror, isn't it? It is reflecting your own inner life state in the state of Buddhahood. So, uh, this is where you're doing everything to yourself, right here. It's you that's allowing yourself to be obsessed with some slanderous thing, isn't it? And through doing that within yourself, within yourself, you're putting your own thinking process out of balance. This is simple, really. So you are the one who's breaking your head into seven pieces. Not literally, but throwing your thoughts out of balance and distorting them. So I do hope that's clear. Uh, I know you've heard all about slander on this course already, so there's no need for me to dwell on it. But what I want to be clear today is that we bring this on ourselves. The Gohonzon isn't some totem, you know, or magic power outside of us. The Gohonzon works because we choose to chant Daimoku to it and look into the mirror at what is actually in our own lives. And remember, Nichiren Daishonin was so strict on this point, he was virtually saying, that if you do not understand that the Gohonzon exists within yourself, you're not practicing my Buddhism. So we have to struggle with that tendency to want to pin our hopes on something outside ourselves. This is not outside ourselves. This is just a mirror to show inside ourselves. Isn't it? So I do hope everyone understands that. And of course, if you have trouble with slander, uh, in a big way, then it's very important to chant to the Gohonzon for the wisdom or perception to see when this horrible slander is beginning. And so that you can chop it off with your daimoku and tell that devil, devilish force of life, to get out of the way. Because after a time you realize it's just bringing you unhappiness. If it's minor slander, such as the examples I gave first, then your daily gongyo and daimoku keeps that in order. As Gicho Dr. Yamazaki was saying the other day, 